I'm Lynn manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I'm Keith Chow. I'm Brittany Monet. So much for a hiatus, Brittany. I I know. We jinxed ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wondering why we're podcasting yet again, if, if Hard Knock Life is showing up in your feed, even though we promised two weeks in a row that we would go on break. And let me just call out Jamie Noguchi of the fucking Do It cast because he was making fun of us for going on break. We haven't even gone on break yet, Jamie. So <laughs> later in the podcast, I'll be speaking with President Obama's chief speechwriter, Cody Keenan. We talk about his new book, Grace, President Obama and 10 Days in the Battle for America. He's also a big fan of DC Comics. And we're going to talk about the parallels between President Obama and his favorite superhero, Superman, as well as other things. So stay tuned for that. But first, we got to talk about what's happening and DC Studios. The Hollywood Reporter dropped yet another bomb that had to do mm-hmm. with DC Studios. James Gunn and Peter Safran, of course, are the co-CEOs of DC Studios, and they're in the process of presenting their future plans to David Zasloff. But in the meantime, what we've known of the DC Universe could be coming to an end. The big news that yeah. dropped is Patty Jenkins has been removed from Wonder Woman 3, I don't know that we can safely say Wonder Woman 3 is canceled. Yeah. We just know Patty Jenkins ain't doing it. Yeah, that's pretty much what we've seen. That's that's at least not happening. And that's just part of it. That was like the lead story and a pretty big story about the future of DC Studios. Yeah, it was like one thing after another with DC. And I was just like, oh, we're going to have to come back from my case. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, so we were all excited a couple months ago when we learned James Gunn was taking over DC Studios. Mm -hmm. And for what it's worth, he's actually come out and made statements on Twitter after the Hollywood Reporter story, kind of saying some of it's true, some of it's not true. But he won't, you know, of course, he won't Mm -hmm. specify what is and what isn't true. Essentially, what the THR story is saying is that there are actual possibilities. They didn't say for sure that, like, they're canceling Mm -hmm. the DCEU. But they're saying one possibility after the fallout of the Wonder Woman fiasco is that they're just going to start over. Mm -hmm. That everything that we've been assuming, particularly with like Henry Cavill's return as Superman, everything that we we know that there are four movies coming out next year. Mm -hmm. Shazam, Flash, Blue Beetle, and Aquaman. Mm -hmm. So 2023 could be the end of the DCEU slash the Snyderverse slash whatever, like mm-hmm. everything we've come to know. And one option for Gun and Company is to just start over, get rid of Gal Gadot, get rid of Henry Cavill, get rid of Jason Momoa, mm-hmm. bring him back as Lobo. Yeah, that's what that's what I saw. And I was just like, it's so funny because we were literally talking about how <laughs> he could have been a good Lobo. Yeah, well, clearly they think so too. Well, allegedly think so. We Again, we don't mm-hmm. know the details. But I know there's a lot of consternation around the fact that James Gunn and company could be blowing it up. Yeah. Again, he said some of it's true, some of it's not true. So we don't know Yeah. what's happening. And then people were asking him, I think, if he hates Henry Cavill. And he's like, that's not true. <laughs> right. So whatever's happening with Henry, it is not out of a, like, if let's say Henry doesn't come back as Superman, it's not out of a he doesn't like Henry Cavill. Right. Like, I think if, if anything, if Henry Cavill doesn't come back, it's more of like getting rid of the Snyderverse. Right. They just want to put their stamp on it. Yeah. Which again, I wonder mm-hmm. how Peacemaker and Suicide Squad will fit into a completely rebooted DC universe because they're moving forward with those. And they've also said Matt Reeves' Batverse is untouchable yes as of right now and as of this recording todd phillips just released the first photo from joker 2 so the non-canonical movies are still Mm -hmm. going forward i mean as is always the case when we talk about these it's a it's a mess i don't know know what to (laughs) i don't know what to think 
I just hope that this time it is going to lead them in the right direction because it sounds like James is saying like, you know, that yes, some things will be interconnected, some won't, which I think is fine because not every single story needs to be interconnected to work mm-hmm. well. So I think that as long as DC is doing their own thing, I think they'll be fine eventually as soon as they get their like bearings. I'm really hoping that this time around they will. Maybe we will find a way to get Leslie Grace back as Batgirl. That was a, also another kind of like small thing that came out last mm-hmm. week is that the Batgirl directors had apparently had a meeting with James Gunn. So we don't know what yeah. that's about. Yeah. So <laughs> the other funny thing about the Wonder Woman story is that the Hollywood Reporter story came out literally 24 hours after Gal Gadot had posted on Instagram a photo of Wonder Woman saying, I can't wait for y'all to see the next chapter in our story. <laughs> and like literally yeah, the next I, day, they were like, uh, uh, Wonder Woman 3 is not happening. I think it was really funny because everyone was making jokes about like James Gunn saw her post and said, nope, not on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like they forgot about Wonder Woman and Gal Gadot's post reminded them or something. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we forgot yeah. to tell her it ain't happening. And so just to back up a bit, the rap came out a few days after the Hollywood Reporter to clarify some things. And it turned out it wasn't that Warner Brothers necessarily canceled Wonder Woman 3. It's that they had notes. They didn't like the treatment Patty Jenkins came with. And Patty mm-hmm. Jenkins refused. Basically, she said, well, if we're not doing this story, I'm not doing it and walked away. That's that's another layer of the story, apparently, that it wasn't just like they came and said, no, nope, get out of here. They, they actually... Yeah. allegedly told her go back to the drawing board and she was like nope this is the story i want to tell if you don't want me to tell it i'm walking yeah and my only thing is with wonder woman too if she had entire free reigns on the whole story and where it went then i can see why they would might tell her hey go <laughs> back to the drawing board yeah but if wonder woman 2 was a mess because of you know studio interference then you know i feel like her walking away was the best thing then but you know which one it is you know, I, mean, I don't know all accounts is that patty jenkins had complete control over 1984 so i don't know if if that's the reason and <laughs> didn't do well i don't i mean and i don't want to disparage patty jenkins she's a great director i love that yeah. first wonder woman movie and you know she, at the same time she lost rogue squadron mm. and this isn't the first time she's been booted from a superhero movie she was supposed to do thor the dark world yeah and then, got fired or walked off that one too so like uh, yeah i don't know i just hope that uh wonder woman 2 is so bad so it's hard to like i don't know it just was just a miss right well yeah. and then the other the other thing that's kind of like brewing in this in these dc streets is that there's some controversy over how well black adam did or didn't do at the box office mm-hmm. and dwayne johnson's been like very adamant that no, we're 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 posting a profit. We're because like there's essentially like the story, the narrative is that Black Adam was a flop and there won't be a sequel yeah. and it was too expensive. And so, you know, Dwayne Johnson's out there like tweeting about the movie actually turned a profit and we're not struggling financially. And he he posted this really long, you know, cell phone in a car video. You know, whenever whenever a celebrity starts like videotaping themselves in their car while they're driving, it's always a little sus, but like he, he had this long diatribe while he was driving to work about how Black Adam came to be and how he fought so hard to bring Henry Cavill back as Superman. And and the funny thing is, like, all those announcements that came out in, in October about, like, yes, Cavill's back. Apparently, there was never a deal signed. It was just, like, I think Johnson and, and his, like, crew kind of throwing their muscle around and maybe forcing Warner Brothers' hand. And so now that... <laughs> Cavill quit The Witcher. Yes, to pretty much be Superman again. So it's just like, apparently he also quit because he didn't like the creative like way that they were taking The Witcher because mm-hmm. he apparently is a huge fan of the book series and the video game. Because he's a nerd, as we've established yes, on this podcast. Like, hardcore nerd. So it's just like, it's hard to say if he quit because he got Superman or again, apparently, or if it just really was a creative differences on The Witcher and he felt like, as a fan of the, the you know the existing material it wasn't what it should be but if it was for superman i feel real bad because you know he might doesn't look like he's gonna be superman yeah and i think it was the rap or maybe another i mean there's too many of these damn hollywood trade publications mm-hmm. to keep track of but another report came out that uh batman project was being canceled mm-hmm. in and you know in, in in the run-up to all these all these like tumultuous DC Studios news 
And then it was revealed that the Batman movie that got canceled was a Batman Beyond movie featuring Michael mm-hmm. Keaton and Michelle Pfeiffer returning as Selena Kyle. Yeah. That one stung. Yeah. Because one, they've already can't we alluded to earlier, they've already canceled Batgirl, which was going to feature Michael Keaton. Mm-hmm. Still don't know what's going to be happening with this Flash movie that's coming out or not in June. And now it turns out that there was yet another Michael Keaton Batman movie. The Batman movie everyone's been clamoring for for decades. A Batman Beyond movie featuring Michael mm-hmm. Keaton as the older Bruce Wayne. And then that one's apparently getting the axe. So man, I'm just cancel culture is out of control. That's all I gotta say. Yeah. I'm so sad about this, Brittany. No, me too, because I was looking forward to a Batman Beyond type of movie and the fact that it was with Michael Keaton and just and then hearing because I didn't know that they were gonna have Michelle Pfeiffer in it until they released that bit and it just made it more like <laughs> <laughs> why would you tell me this now <laughs> like i'm more upset particularly like you know christmas time is batman returns time like this is when i start watching batman returns because it's my christmas movie yeah and to hear that like the proper follow-up is not happening i'm 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 beside myself yeah it's so i uh, i don't know but i really did like the suicide squad and, and uh peacemaker so i'm really hoping that you know what james gunn is doing is uh, for the better and everything will be great so i'm hoping that we'll see great you know an overall turnout for dc because i feel like they deserve to win <laughs> yeah i mean as we've said you and i used to, like we got in this podcast game hosting a dc podcast right like yeah dc is my bread and butter that's the you know i mean i love all of it right i'm a, I'm a nerd and and mm-hmm. i don't I actually don't believe in pitting one against the other. Like you can love all of it. I got DC figures and Marvel figures on my shelves, right? Like I read both books, Mm -hmm. but at heart, I'm a DC guy, right? Batman and Superman, my favorite superheroes. And I, like you said, I want to see the, the movies do well. And Mm -hmm. it just, it just seems to be (laughs) every couple years, DC is just not getting their shit together. Whether yeah. it's like fits and starts starting a universe and then not starting the universe, having studio interference or not having like it's never been just like smooth sailing no. since the Nolan movies. Like the, the the Nolan movies was the last time people like said DC's on you know kind of untouchable, and then it was it's been a series of just like <laughs> a series of four unfortunate events ever since. Yeah. I mean, and the Batman really seemed like, okay, maybe this is the turnaround. And I still hope that it is with, you know, between Matt Reeves and maybe James Gunn doing their own little things with DC that it will be good. It just might take a while for everything across the board to feel that way and not just like that thing's good and that thing's good. But, you know, but I've, I don't know, we'll see. And maybe they'll outdo Marvel because Marvel's starting to kind of maybe be in their flop era. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, and but that's the thing, like, I'm still kind of confused about because, like, in the Hollywood Reporter story, it said, if anything is certain, it's Matt Reeves is still going to have complete control over his Batman universe. Yeah. And that's not going to cross over with whatever James Gunn and Peter Safran are doing with DC yeah. Studios. And then, but, like, that just reminds me of how it always has been. Like, mm-hmm. a bunch of competing visions. And, you know, but the thing is, like, I'm fine with that. Like, that's kind of where... The DC mm-hmm. Studios slash DCEU slash DC Films. That's kind of where it is right now. Yeah. Right? Like, you already have, like, all these different factions. As we said, the Joker movie series is happening separate from everything. Mm-hmm. The Batman movies. And then you had, like, kind of, like, the Snyderverse. You had, like, his Zack Snyder trilogy kind of existing in its own world. You had the Arrowverse. You had the HBO Max verse with Teen Titans and mm-hmm. Doom Patrol. Like you had all these different kind of like factions. And what I'm kind of confused about now is that James Gunn is saying he's creating a singular cohesive story across film, TV, streaming, animation, and mm-hmm. gaming, which is like, you know, I know you're a big Star Wars fan, but sometimes I think one of the honestly, one of the issues with Star Wars continuity is that mm-hmm. there's so much of it that it's going to be difficult to and it's already happening like tales of the jedi contradicted a bunch of stuff that happened in the books and pissed a bunch of people off well the tales of the jedi were supposed to be like from what i heard before i haven't watched i still haven't watched it yet but it was supposed to be just like kind of like star wars what if versions Mm. and i don't know if they made that clear that's what it is or they went back on their word saying it's like 
the Star Wars What If. So I just I haven't seen it yet. So I mean, supposed to be, but what I'm saying is it's hard to keep track of everything. Oh, it is. Um, and I I think that if you don't want to read anything that's in the like timeline that you know, that's why I always say the High Republic is great because it takes place 200 years before <laughs> the Skywalkers are involved, so you can kind of have fun and just read and not worry about like what's going on. But I worry with DC if if the mm-hmm. if the idea really is to like connect everything. You know, because again, right now we we live in a space where like there are multiple timelines, multiple continuities, multiple mm-hmm. narratives. Like, but if we have to live in a world where the animated Harley Quinn and the Margot Robbie Harley Quinn and the video game Suicide Squad, like they all have to kind of live in the same world. I don't know. I just to me, yeah. I don't find that promising. I almost find that like mm-hmm. worrisome. Yeah, because it's also because it's so hard to keep track of. I feel like again, Warner Brothers has a history of like uh let's blow that up (laughs) and then no one wants to be invested if like you can't trust that it's going to be around for more than a couple years yeah i i don't know i i just hope they get stuff right this Mm -hmm. time around whichever way they decide to go i just hope they get things right and everything is good and there's what is your preference what would you rather like if you were in the room with james gunn and peter saffron they turned to you and said "Brittany." We're we're at an impasse. Tell us what to do. What would you tell them? I honestly think they should build their universe around the Bat Reeves Batman. That's my genuine opinion because I think what Matt Reeves has done with Batman is just phenomenal. And not just because Robert Pattinson, but like I really just really loved like that movie. It was so good. So I don't know. I feel like they maybe need to work with Matt Reeves and come up with a cohesive way to make you know, that Batman be able to exist with a Superman and a Wonder Woman and like Hawk Girl and Hawkman. Like, I feel like there's got to be a way to, you know, bring the fantasy part of the DC universe, that makes sense, into like the Batman side of it too. Um, And I feel like Matt Reeves and James Gunn working together, honestly, would be really good. Mm -hmm. So you're saying like, start over, have the Batman be the first movie in this new DC Studios cinematic universe yeah i mean i feel like it's fine if you start off with matt reeves batman stuff kind of being the starting point of the new universe and then slowly fold in other things with it but I don't so know. you would go and recast everybody or would yeah. you bring something like bring in henry cavill's superman but he's not the superman from the Snyderverse? yeah because i feel like henry cavill was always the perfect choice for superman he just got not a great written superman where people root it for him honestly so yeah i feel like if they can find a way to give him a decent superman that would be nice but yeah maybe there's some other people who could like i don't know i'm torn between keeping jason momo as aquaman but then like also him as lobo would be (laughs) just have him play both why can't you just play both you're right (laughs) (laughs) i don't know i just feel like then it would be i would feel really bad if the only thing that is going well in like dcu is matt reeves and then you know, James Gunn doing all this stuff. I I don't know. I just hope that he can handle being ahead of a studio. Mm-hmm. I think he is really like obviously a great director and writer. So, in terms of him creating stuff, I'm not worried about that. I just don't know. You know, transitioning from running a studio, I don't know. I hope I hope it goes well for him because genuinely, mm-hmm. I would. I just like. I don't know. I really did like the Suicide Squad and and peacemaker so we'll see well and i mean again it goes back to what i was saying earlier about like when he first took over he said don't you know peacemaker is still green lit we're working on season two you know the finale established it's firmly mm-hmm. in the world where barry allen and arthur curry are the versions we've seen in previous films mm-hmm. and if season two like again we're, we're maybe making too big a deal over like specific timelines and continuities but like if you're blowing it up can you really have a peacemaker season two or would that just be a whole new thing i mean it reminds me of like when dc did the new 52 and mm-hmm. they blew up their universe but like jeff johns was like but we're keeping my green lantern stories i'm not changing <laughs> i'm you know even though it's supposed to be this whole new universe mm-hmm. i've been telling these green lantern stories for like 10 years so i'm not actually going to redo that continuity yeah and scott snyder was doing the same thing with batman it's like oh yeah i've been doing my batman story so i know we're rebooting the universe but my batman is still like all the stories that i've been telling are already are still in continuity so it's like 
Batman had five Robins in the span of like three years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all the Robins still like came along and died and were reborn. But then, but that Batman in the new 52 would have only been around for a couple years. So it was just like, they were just shoehorning because they refused to kind of like play along basically mm-hmm. with the whole rebooted universe. Anyway, like that's kind of like, I feel like what's going to be happening here. Like we're going to reboot the universe, yeah. but we're still going to have all these pockets and, then it's, my thing is like, why don't we just keep it the way it is then? Because that's how it is now. Like there are all these different pocket universes and I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I just hope this time, like, you know, DC will have multiple wins in a row and not just like the few that are stretched out. Mm-hmm. Cause like I've always said, DC has great characters. It's just to people who don't, people who haven't seen maybe like at least the animated stuff they're gonna assume that dc is just you know what now Zack snyder has done and Mm -hmm. that's the problem is like there's so many people who just do not vibe with Zack snyder's like style of filmmaking so it's just like that's what most general audiences and stuff view dc as that and that's why like people are like well marvel's at least better than what Zack snyder Mm -hmm. does so that's why, you know, Marvel's probably still doing as well as it is, too. But also now it's like you said, we're invested in this, like, you know, 12 year running TV show in a way. Mm-hmm. So it's just like everyone's invested in that because we've seen it. And it's been I don't know. It's just so like, yeah. Well, know. and the thing is, like, you know, Aquaman, for for what we know, is still planning to come out in December of next year. Mm-hmm. And re- if you remember, like they brought back Ben Affleck to do a cameo as Bruce Wayne. Yeah, is that still going to be in the movie? Because if like we're blowing up the universe, it's kind of like that. It's like the Superman cameo at the end of Black Adam. It's a promise of nothing that's going to happen. Oh, and speaking of Superman yeah. cameos, apparently he shot. He went in and, and shot another cameo for the Flash. Oh, which may or may not survive because. Again, he may or may yeah. be our Superman going forward. So I don't know. Just like it's just so kind of like a 180 from where I felt in October mm-hmm. when the Black Adam movie came out. And then like the next like a couple of days later is when they announced James Gunn was taking over DC. And yeah. it was like, oh wow, that's awesome. You know, and then <laughs> now it feels like there's like a there's a bunch of like power plays going on within the studio. Yeah. And it just seems like a. I still haven't like seen Black show. Adam yet, but it is coming on HBO, HBO Max. Max next week. Yes, if you were like me and haven't seen it, I will be watching it next week. Yeah. <laughs> Are you trying to say we're going to be coming back and not going on hiatus? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm just saying I will be watching it next week. So. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we just wanted to to reconvene briefly because again the dc universe stuff is just so volatile that we just had to talk about it we i couldn't go yeah. like if we can but who knows when we come back in january there's gonna be so much other things to talk about like the the twists if and turns of the roller actually coaster get, besides like christmas weekend if we actually get a genuine like two week hiatus we'll see <laughs> <laughs> because there's they're apparently like presenting their plan to david zaslov this week okay. so who knows what's going to leak from that and well maybe we'll know more but for what we know we'll just say we'll come back in january (laughs) unless again more more fireworks go on (laughs) in this coming week (laughs) anyway Brittany, before we break and and go to my interview with cody keenan how can people find you on the interwebs um, you can find me at Hi Brittany Renee on Twitter, Instagram, and, and I think Hive is down, but you can follow me there. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you can follow me on social media at the real chow on Twitter, the underscore real underscore chow, and the real chow no underscores on Hive, and at real Keith Chow on Instagram. Follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color on all social media platforms and go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all the podcasts in the family. Give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to our videos at youtube.com slash the nerds of color and support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nerds of color. And we'll go to break. After the break, you'll hear my interview with President Obama's former chief speechwriter, Cody Keenan. 
he recently released his memoir working in the White House called Grace. And we also chat about DC and what he would do as the head of DC Studios if he were in James Gunn's position. So check that out. And we'll see you in 2023, maybe. Guess what? Goalie Nutrition is sponsoring Hard Knock Life. And you can go to goalie.com to buy apple cider vinegar gummies. They're ashwagandha gummies, super fruit gummies, and super greens gummies. And you get 10% off plus free shipping if you use the code HARDKNOCK at goalie.com. This is honestly, I've been taking the goalie gummies now for, for a couple weeks. And I have to say, they're tasty and they're good for you. Have you guys been enjoying the goalie gummies? I really like them. They're yummy, but it's a nice to add to my like routine of already like I normally take just straight vitamin C, so it's nice to have like extra supplements. For a long time people have have praised the benefits of apple cider vinegar and, you know, as someone who's had to like drink straight apple cider vinegar sometimes when I'm not <laughs> feeling well or, you know, I have a some joint pain and your mom is like, "Drink some apple cider vinegar." It's mm. not the most appetizing home remedy let's just say no, right. it tastes horrible so like the apple cider part is like ooh, does it taste like apple cider and it's like no it tastes like vinegar but acv is very good for you and the fact that goalie has been able to put the acv into these tasty little gummies made with pectin and fruit peels which make them vegan which is cool so if you're vegan you can still rock these gummies because everyone knows gummies are usually made out of like gelatin and nasty shit this these are made out of complete non-gmo gelatin-free gluten-free vegan ingredients and you can get the benefits all the benefits of apple cider vinegar taking these tasty delicious convenient gummies so go to goalie.com and use the code hard knock that's h-a-r-d-n-o-c just like the podcast you're listening to get 10 percent off your purchase of goalie products and free shipping it's a much better delivery device for that apple cider vinegar yeah these goalie gummies are great you get it and it's it's a delicious little candy and i've been enjoying the super fruits one i did feel kind of refreshed after taking a few of those yeah no but i'm loving them so far and they're definitely tasty if you just want tasty gummies at least just (laughs) eat them for the the, like the yummy yes yeah So go to goalie.com, use the code HARDNOCK, H-A-R-D-N-O-C, get 10% off your purchase and free shipping at goalie.com with the code HARDNOCK. I am so excited to be joined by my guest this week. He is the New York Times bestselling author of Grace, President Obama in 10 Days in the Battle for America. He is also President Obama's former speechwriter and the only former Obama staffer who doesn't have his own podcast yet. Please welcome back to the Nerds of Color, Cody Keenan. What's up, Keith? Good to see you again, man. I'm glad you're on this podcast, uh, even if you don't have your own just yet. Is that is that in the cards? It sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> and it's funny because, like, everyone, including the former president, like, he had a podcast. Like, he and Bruce Springsteen did a podcast. What is what is the appeal of podcasts, I'm asking, while I'm also doing a podcast? I, there's there I don't know there's so many of them that I just always feel overwhelmed by what to listen to and you know since COVID I don't have a commute anymore because we're we're still working from home just because we have a daughter we've been too lazy to find right anywhere else to go um so the my my listening list is is pretty short <laughs> I, my publishing house tried to get me to do one just to sell this book and I yeah. told them no, <laughs> you know, you'd really be happy to guest on they, podcasts, they, but you don't want to host your yeah. own. Right? Yeah, that's much easier. Just showing up is a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Well, this one, we get to talk about DC, not just the nation's capital, but home of our favorite superheroes. But I did want to talk a little bit about the book because one, it is a great book, Cody. Congratulations. Who knew you were such a great writer? <laughs> it's, you know, to, to put something under your own name, though, is scary. Um, yeah. It's, it's the first time I've had to do it. You know, I always had everything I ever wrote was was filtered through Obama, which is great. Uh, but to put your own name on it is, is a little frightening. Yeah. Well, you know, and the thing about the book, like when it came, it came out in October, right? Like yeah. early October. So the environment now, like reading the book versus the reading the book back in October is a little bit different, I think, because... Like, what I love about the book is that it, one, made me nostalgic for, like, the Obama presidency, but it also was, like, filled with so much hope. And at the time, you know, we're barreling down towards this midterm election where everything felt like it was coming off the rails. Reading the book now and, like, talking to you about the book now, post-midterm elections, post, you know, the Congress passing the Respect for Marriage Act, 
it kind of like brings you back to that period in those 10 days that you wrote about in grace just like there's actually hope again in america i guess is what i'm saying despite all yeah, the dude. like dark clouds that are still swirling up there if you're giving my book credit for the midterms i'll take it yeah um, <laughs> that's like basically that's what i'm saying <laughs> yeah i mean you know the, the book is very honest about the fact that you know those those 10 days in a way uh in several ways kind of felt like a triumph despite the fact that they were rooted in unimaginable horror and grief but they were followed by these four years that were basically the opposite and that's what that's what actually gave me the idea for the book was was kind of living through the upside down but it's also clear by the fact that progress is not something you can ever take for granted it's always yeah. not just fragile but it's something you you constantly have to protect and secure and then fight for to get the rest and you know one of the one of the few bright lights of the trump years was that so many people actually realized that and got involved and engaged in democracy and i think you know the coolest thing that we're only just starting to see is all these people running for office who quote unquote aren't supposed to be running for office that's something Michelle Obama said at the portrait mailing at the White House a few months ago, the phrase uh, supposed to, you know, she said, I was never supposed to be here. And who decides what that means? And so, you know, with each successive election since 2016, you've got more people running for office who are actually more representative of America and have diverse and different perspectives that match, you know, what the country really looks like. We've got the first Gen Z Congress member now. And there was kind of a, there was a great story about him in the paper the other day someone who's actually grown up, know what it's like to work in the gig economy, going through active shooter drills in school, like the things that right. my students go through. There's finally a member of Congress that has lived their lives. And I think that's only going to keep getting more prolific and more profound in the years to come. And, and I think just even the fact that this is like two midterms in a row where the turnout was like presidential level. To, like imagine had Obama had that kind of turnout in the midterms when you guys were in office like because that's always the thing is like you know turnout is always really low in the midterms but then you know the, the opposing party always feels like they have a mandate when it's like like literally a third of the people came out to vote for you you know what i mean like there is no mandate but like the tea party republicans back in 2010 was like this is what the country wants and and you know the political press kind of treats them as if like that was a mandate but like we're seeing like in 2018 and now in 2022 like there really is this kind of acceptance that like we can't just vote every four years we have to vote every year and we have to organize yeah. every year yeah and there's very real consequences for it too i mean what happened earlier this year with the dobbs decision on the supreme court that overturned roe was that was rooted in 2014 when there was really low turnout republicans took back the senate and mitch mcconnell blocked president obama from from putting merrick garland on the supreme court right. And that set the stage then for, for Trump to rush through three justices. And that set the stage for overturning Roe. And, you know, all these things take a long time to, to bear fruit. I mean, the Dobbs decision was also the result of 50 years of conservatives mm -hmm. trying to do this. You know, even, even those off-year elections, uh, midterm elections really matter. Yeah. You chose June 17th, 2015 to start the narrative of grace. And one thing, and of course, that's the day that Dylan Roof murdered parishioners at the Mother Manual Church in South Carolina. But what I didn't realize until I got to the prologue is that the day before, had you done 11 days in the battle for America, the day before was Trump's escalator thing. Like, that's wild too to think about, like just what happened in that two week period. And it kind of did set the stage, as I said earlier, for what like America we're still experiencing here in 2022. Like, did you know in the moment, like what made you decide that like, I want to talk about these specific 10, 11 days in 2015. It's a couple of things. One is, you know, the sheer magnitude of events that happened over those 10 days. I remember somebody writing uh, at the end of the, at the end of that period, it was, it was a series of events too implausible for an entire season of the West Wing. You know, you had, <laughs> you had this um, white supremacist you know, murder nine black parishioners in their church uh, and say he wanted to start a race war. You had the families of the victims forgive him in open court at his arraignment, you had Republican governors, you know, I really think based off what those families did and, and the reaction, everything kind of quietly bring down the Confederate flag over a couple of Southern state houses. And as you mentioned, we were, we were preparing for these Supreme Court rulings on marriage equality and on Obamacare. And there was a chance that the Supreme Court would, you know, kick millions of 
people who were working two jobs, uh, but making too much money to qualify for Medicaid, kick them off their insurance. And then for, you know, what rarely covered was the fact that 120, 140 million people who got their insurance through their employer were going to lose all their protections, like pre-existing uh, conditions right. protections. There was a very real chance that the Supreme Court was going to tell millions of Americans, you can't get married to who you love, effectively, you know, declaring them second class citizens. And through it all, we're deciding whether or not Obama's actually going to speak in Charleston because he didn't want to. Uh, and I didn't want right. to write another eulogy. We'd already done a dozen of these. But ultimately, he does. You know, we, we win both those Supreme Court cases. And then on the on the 10th day, uh, when marriage equality hits, he also flies down to Charleston. Amazing grace. And gives this eulogy where he sings Amazing Grace and comes back and the White House is lit up in all the colors of the rainbow. I mean, it's just... It's, it's, it was just wild and dramatic and exhausting, but all of those events also speak to something big, which is, you know, who we are as Americans, whether or not we actually believe that all of us are created equal, whether we're going to stand up to racism and bigotry, and inequality, and, 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 you know, practice what we preach. And in that week, it, it felt over and over like the resounding answer was yes. And then, of course, you know, we lived through four years after that. So it's, it's just this this constant struggle, uh, you know, the, the, I borrowed uh, Obama's thesis in his summer speech for the book, which is that politics is, is not a clash of armies, it's a clash of wills. Right. It's a contest to determine the true meaning of America. You know, every single election, every single day, what we do, we have to decide what kind of country we want this to be. And then, you know, he even talks about like taking every step you take, you take two steps back. And, you know, a lot of the fights that we we're having in 2015, we're still having, as I said, the Congress you know, the reason Congress had to pass the Respect for Marriage Act is that the Supreme Court after Dobbs was kind of signaling like, hey, you know, gay marriage and interracial marriage might not be, you know, like protected anymore, which is wild to think about. Yeah. But, you know, that's but that kind of spurs us on to have to to do something about that. You know, the other thing that comes out reading the book is, you know, you often describe like kind of like imposter syndrome, right? Writing for of all people, President Obama. I think you even said like, it's fucking terrifying to, to write for him. And you know, like you had been with the president since the campaign, right? Like you were yeah. there from Jump Street before he became like the Barack Obama. Like there was of course the, the 2004 speech, but you knew him before everyone else really kind of like saw him as, as this political superstar. But you know, what, when someone as, as good a writer as, President Obama, because like, no shade to like past presidents. I feel like Obama is probably the best. Like, if he wasn't president, he would be like, I mean, he was a best selling author. Like, what goes through your mind when you're sitting down, like having to write a speech for him? Because unlike, you know, Trump, who just like, <laughs> who doesn't look at a speech until it's in the teleprompter, right? Like, you're collaborating in line edits and red markers and everything like that for like hours and hours and days and days. Like, just walk us through that kind of feeling of writing for one of the best writers to ever grace the Oval Office. Yeah, it is fucking terrifying. Um, <laughs> and it's specifically because he is such a good writer. I mean, he he reminds me to this day that he wrote that 2004 speech by himself, <laughs> that he wrote his books by himself. And he's on record saying, I'm a better speechwriter than my speechwriters. I'll get, I'll get to the terrifying part. He always viewed speechwriting as a collaboration between mm -hmm. him and his speechwriters. And there was a, a, a team of eight of us uh, that wrote for him. Uh, just, and I loved every single one of them. We, he just wanted us to give him something he could work with because he would he would stay up late every night. His favorite time to write was between midnight and 2 a.m. And he that's when he'd do all of his edits that you've probably seen in Pete Sousa's photos. But that was never enough for us. We wanted to impress him. We wanted to get mm -hmm. him you know, that perfect draft. We wanted to get him something great because he was good to us. He was a good boss. And, and you know, that's that's something you want to reward. So the the terrifying part was trying to get him that perfect draft, even though he never asked for it. And, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pretty honest about it in the, in the, throughout this book, but especially with the eulogy after Charleston, you know, I felt like I hadn't quite, I knew I hadn't quite gotten it where it needed to be and told him as much. And he called me back into the White House around 11 p.m. the night before the eulogy. Um, this is day nine of the book. And uh, he had just crossed out the last two pages in their entirety, which he'd never done to me before, and rewrote them longhand. And so I apologized to him. You know, I think it was the first and only time I apologized to him for for not meeting the moment. And he said, "Look, brother, we're collaborators. You know, mm -hmm. you gave me what I needed to work with here. And when you when you look through what I wrote, you're going to see a lot of your work in there. But but when more importantly, when you've been thinking about these issues for 40 years, you'll know what you want to say too. And and that's what made him a good boss. That's why we wanted to." 
get him something great. You know, he could have just said, if you can't do this, I'll find someone who can, or, or even worse, he could have just handed the edits to somebody else and excised me from the process entirely. But he took the time at midnight to sit me down and walk me through what he did. And so you, what's important about that is you leave there feeling fired up instead of let down. And yeah. It was just good that way. And, you know, you mentioned that having 40 years to think about these kinds of issues, like that also, that's another theme in the book about how, you know, Obama's speechwriters have always been white males. And, and, you know, you kind of struggle with that. And you talk about these things, like what happened in South Carolina, or even the Selma speech, which you actually start the book off in the prologue about preparing for this. I love, I love the shade you throw at how DC handles snow coming from Chicago, you and you and the president, (laughs) just like, for those who don't know, Washington does not handle snow very well. Anyway, sorry for the, (laughs) sorry for the weather report tangent, but like, Chicago can handle its snow is what I'm saying. The, the question I'm trying to ask is, how do you resolve that? The idea that like the first black president, that you're you're writing for the first black president, you know, writing about race in America in the wake of, you know, white supremacists attacked on a Southern church in the wake of the anniversary of Selma. Walk us through like your mindset and 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 what you kind of like resolve or don't necessarily resolve, but wrestle with in the book. Yeah. And you can add, you know, Trayvon Martin, Ferguson, all sorts of things to that list. It was always a challenge, not because, you know, I harbored views that were different than his, but you still <laughs> want to, you still want to do it justice. And, you know, to be a speechwriter means you can write for anybody. You have to yeah. inhabit somebody's mind and understand not just what they want to say, but why they want to say it. And so empathy is really important to that. You want to be able to understand every audience, walk around in their shoes. And, you know, there are limits to that. You can, you can, you know, talk to all sorts of people you can read every book in existence but you know i've never lived the black experience in america it's really different you can imagine what it is you can read about it but it's just not the same and so you know fortunately he really was our chief speechwriter, and so mm-hmm. any any speech process would begin with a lot of listening i'd ask him questions to get some good prompts out of them and, and then try to try to do it justice i mean that's my nervousness was in giving him the draft because mm-hmm. anything i wrote didn't just go out into the world you know, a fait accompli, he would, he would dive in and edit and, and get it to the right place. But you didn't want to write anything for him that would kind of expose you as, as a fraud or, you know, somebody has no idea what they're talking about. But I asked him, I asked him once pretty early in my tenure as chief speechwriter, said, you know, do you wish you had a black chief speechwriter? And he said, well, he said two things. He said, number one, the system doesn't allow for it, which mm-hmm. is a little, a little fatalistic coming from him. But, but what he meant was, you know, politics is still very much a white man's profession, just like everything else. It's changing a little right. too slowly. But, you know, one of one of the perks of being who I was is when I first moved to Washington and the only job I could find was an unpaid internship in the Senate. You know, I had parents who could help me with my rent until I right. until I made that first eighteen thousand dollar a year job. <laughs> That excludes a lot of good people from the political yeah. process. It's changing now. A lot of internships on Capitol Hill are paid, and they're actually paid more than my entire first year <laughs> salary, which is great. But it's it's a real battle to slowly change this. And it's just not something there's time for in the White House, as rough as that sounds. You, when you're trying to you know, rescue the global economy and, and fight all these battles at the same time and put out all these fires, you don't get free time to try to reform the system. That's something my firm is working on now. We, you know, by the by the second term, we had gotten the speechwriting shop to the point where we had we had one writer of color and we were half women. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. great because you get more diverse perspectives and life experiences on the team. There's still a long way to go. I have a speechwriting firm now called Fenway, and we are half writers of color and half women. And we're still always trying to do better. Uh, there's a great group out there called Speechwriters of Color that's working to change things. But it's just like any other arena, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. But it's just it's really, really important. <laughs> Did you ever like sit through any of Trump's speeches and, you know, aside from like the terrible content of like what Trump was saying in those speeches, but like, think about like, how the fuck did Stephen Miller get, like, he succeeded you as chief speechwriter in the White House. And to your point about like taking the profession seriously. And then yet this clown is like (laughs) delivering speeches for the president that are like, again, aside from the terrible content, terribly written. Like, did you ever just like, tear your hair out or i mean i'm sure there were other things that are <laughs> more more dire during the trump presidency than like yeah. oh my god stephen miller is such a shitty writer but yeah as pieces of rhetoric they weren't good it was just word salad uh, <laughs> white nationalist ambrosia um, <laughs> that's i don't know who put my wikipedia page together it's always weird when somebody does one for you but the worst thing on it is the fact that his yeah. name is on there just as my successor 
I've always wished <laughs> I could scrub that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Obama to Trump and then Cody Keenan to Stephen Miller. It's like it is that whole two steps forward, three steps back, Paul Abdul lyric. Anyway, there's a famous Alex Ross painting that he did back in, I believe during the 2008 campaign where, where it's Obama ripping the shirt and he looks like Superman. I'm wondering for you as, as a lifelong Superman fan, like, do you see the resemblance? Like they both stand for hope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Obama embodies everything that you love about Superman. Is that part of what drew you to his campaign and and, and ultimately to, to his right-hand side? Truth, justice in the American way. Yeah. And he, he talked about when I, I, so I was at the 04 speech. I worked for Tech Right, because you worked for time. Kennedy. Yeah. And, and so we were all out there volunteering for the week. And our reward for volunteering, we had to take a week off work to avoid federal election laws and, and campaigning laws. But so our, our reward- Back when people was, had to follow campaign and election yeah, law. Yeah, pesky things like ethics. <laughs> our reward was a floor pass for one night of the convention. And mine happened to be the night that Obama was speaking. I'll be honest, I didn't really know much about him because I had spent- the, the previous two years boning up on Massachusetts politics just for my for my job. And in comes this guy who's, you know, he basically walks into the fleet center anonymous and walks out a global megastar 17 <laughs> minutes later. I mean, that's what a good speech can do. But he talked about politics the way I wanted it to be. You know, he was he was idealistic and hopeful. And that doesn't mean he wasn't realistic either. I've never seen a conflict between realism and idealism. Realism mm -hmm. is approaching the world as it is. And then idealism is is fighting for the world as you want it to be. You know, we joke now about how, I mean, that speech was amazing. The worst parts of it were the parts that sounded like any other typical political speech. And those were the parts about John Kerry and John Edwards, because they just, they had to be in there, you know, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a keynote speaker. But the rest of it was, it was, it, it read and sounded like something that had not been polished over and sandpapered by an army of political advisors and pollsters. And it was just, it was, it was refreshing and new. And it was something that, here's the, the parallel between Obama and Superman, is they made you want to be better. Mm -hmm. They made you want to be the best version of yourself. One thing that a lot of people, particularly like in the post Obama years, and, and you have a lot of like cynicism kind of return in, in, in the political world. And, and, you know, like the parallel too is with, with comics and with Superman, you have a lot of folks who like say Superman's boring or he's too, you know, vanilla, or it's, we don't live in a, in a time where you can have a big blue boy scout anymore. He needs to be dark and gritty. And you saw that in like the movies and things like that. And people will say like, you know, Obama is too naive or too, like the, the politics is just too cynical for someone like Obama. As a fan of Superman and seeing how a lot of writers have kind of like tried to turn him into this more of a, you know, a badass or, or you know, like this all powerful God rather than like the down home salt of the earth from Kansas. Like, if you were James Gunn, right, if you if you had the job to run DC Studios, what would you do with Superman, the character? Yeah, well, you know, cynicism is easy. Cynicism is fashionable, right? Because you're not you're almost never wrong. You mm -hmm. know, if you just if you just think that, oh, that person's going to let us down, politics is going to let me down, then it's, it's, you know, you kind of feel good about yourself when you're rarely wrong. But but sometimes you are wrong and profoundly so. And the people who actually not only believed, but did the effort, did the work to try to change something, that's a much more fulfilling way of being right. You know, another interesting parallel, I think, is I, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with Tom Taylor's run on Son of Superman, you know, on John Kent. There's mm -hmm. this gorgeous page in one of the first issues, second, third, maybe, I'm not sure, where Superman and his son are sitting on the moon looking at earth, having a deep conversation. And like John actually asks his dad, and here's a direct parallel to the Obama years too, you know, why aren't you doing more? Mm -hmm. You know, I, he's, it, it's written from the perspective of kind of a Gen Z or like all my students. And he says, there's, I can see the climate changing, you know, with microscopic mm -hmm. vision or whatever. I can see pain and poverty and inequality and, and people hurting each other. And it's like, dad, why aren't you doing anything about this? And there's like a direct parallel to that. I remember it was, Obama was always bummed out when, you know, his daughter, his own daughters, Malia would ask, you know, why haven't you plugged the hole in the Gulf of Mexico yet when it was <laughs> leaking oil? Right, and right. That really happened. And so I, I understand the temptation to look at politics as if nobody's doing anything because so little ever changes. I mean, the marriage bill is a huge step forward. A bunch of things in the book were a huge step forward. Victories are few and far between in politics. I mean, we spent 2,922 days in the White House and we'd go home happy if we move the ball forward a couple inches each day. And right. 
that that doesn't that is not pessimistic. That that is not giving up. It's because all those inches ultimately add up to first downs, and then you get a touchdown. Right, and it right. just takes a long time. You especially in a democracy, you don't get to do everything you want all the time you want. So for for Superman's own son to criticize him and say you're not doing enough, I think that's how a lot of Gen Zers feel. It's how a lot of my students feel. You know, they they've inherited this kind of world that feels broken and system that feels broken and you know we grown-ups haven't done enough to change it yeah but that's when i think to get back to the actual question that's when i think hope and optimism and idealism are so important it sets an example i mean why would you want to set well actually i know the answer to this if you if you want to set an example of cynicism that's because you don't want the system to change you want people to believe like they have no agency Mm -hmm. You know, actually organizing and inspiring and giving people that agency is what changes things for the better. So how should James Gunn approach this? I, I, I've seen <laughs> the reports that, you know, they want to make it hopier, kind of like the Christopher Reeves version. And I, you know, I think that's great. I think you had, need to have a, so you still need to have a solid villain, even if the villain is cynicism. I mean, that's really mm -hmm. the villain we were fighting in the White House most of the time. It wasn't just Republicans. It was cynicism. Right. So you, you still need a pretty powerful villain there. But I, I think, you know, the bigger thing with with the kind of DC film universe is I think the movies are mostly better than the Marvel movies. And yet you don't want to rewatch them over and over and over. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just you, you kind of have to endure them sometimes. Right. They're and punishing. I say this as a fan. They're yeah. punishing. Whereas, you know, every night when you turn on the television, there is at least one Marvel movie on cable somewhere every <laughs> night, every night, sometimes multiple <laughs> <laughs> and I want to have that on as background noise. You know, yeah. I want to see that again. Why not? How many times have I had, you know, Avengers Endgame just on cable TV at night? But I'm not going to do that for Justice League. You right. know, I'm not going to do that for Man of Steel, as beautiful as that movie was. So their challenge is, you know, it's still a business. You got to you got to want people to want to watch these movies. You know, when Henry Cavill came back and, and he's and he said, I want to I want to bring back Superman to be more hopeful. I mean, I was I was excited because I think one of the things about Henry is that he seems like he could be a great Superman. Like if you see him in interviews and then, you know, when he's on Instagram, like he's kind of dorky, like he's very Clark yeah. Kenty in that way. Yeah. He's very like sincere. But then his Superman is very like stone faced and, and you know, and like I want to see him kind of embrace the more hopey Superman. But at the same time, like the reports you're mentioning, like James Gunn is also talking about you know, just starting, starting over. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that, I guess, even though I want to see Henry get an opportunity to play like the, that more hopeful big blue boy scout, but in, in the event that that doesn't happen and we do have a whole new DC universe to start from scratch. Like, I think you, last time you and I talked, which was like five years ago, and this was like before the justice league came out even. And then, and then, you know, the, the whole DCU kind of falling apart, but at the time you said you actually prefer the more standalone type movies. And, you know, we've had like the Matt Reeves Batman and the Todd Phillips Joker, like are not interconnected. And you mentioned like Marvel is kind of like everything is connected. Would you rather like just have like directors come in and just give me your take on these characters? Or do you feel like, you know, the market is is demanding that there needs to be some connection between all of these different, you know, continuities and, and narratives? I mean, what's the point of having an interconnected universe if it's if it's kind of sputtering out all the time? You know, I was <laughs> one thing I was surprised by in that piece was I didn't know that Black Adam hadn't done well, right? <laughs> uh, you know, and and so it, it's hard to have. I'm surprised that they're doing a Blue Beetle, which I, I yeah. don't think most people have ever even heard of, and then they torpedo Batgirl, and it's like you get the yeah. sense that all of these decisions are just made purely about money, and well, and of course they are, but you don't. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to be the public narrative around your films, <laughs> right? Like, right, when it's like the tax around. break is the reason I canceled this movie. You know, even if that's true, you don't tell people that. Like, that's just so... Talking about cynicism, right? Anybody trying to deny me Michael Keaton's Batman is my enemy. Yeah. You know, that really <laughs> bummed me out. I don't know. I mean, part of it, part of it is... I, I think I'd lean towards... Like, an interconnected universe would, would be more fun, right? You get to see all your favorite characters all the time. Everybody loves a good crossover, you know, mm -hmm. but I do think it'd be more fun uh, to have different directors takes on these things. You know, I, I think the single best argument for for my personal favorite argument for blowing up the DC universe is, is getting Jason Momoa to play Lobo. Yeah. I would be <laughs> Which he should have been that. 10 years ago, right? Like, God, that'd be so been. great. So great to talk about something you're born to play. <laughs> 
I mean, I don't think most people know Lobo either. I don't care. I will be there opening night dragging friends to it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I mean, a good Lobo Superman movie would be fantastic. Yeah. Just fantastic. And there, there was a good, there's a good Lobo Superman series last year. I think it was like a three shot. And even Superman was trying to appeal to like Lobo's better nature, which he doesn't have one, you know, <laughs> but, but even that interplay and dialogue between them was, was really fun and fascinating. So last question about the DC universe. You came to Superman being your favorite character back in the 90s, right? Like Death of Superman was your yeah, it worked. Uh, intro into, into it worked. and talk about like kind of like cynical, you know, plays for, for, you know, getting attention. Let's kill Superman was like the biggest thing of all time in comics. But that that hooked you and you've been a diehard Wednesday warrior ever since. Other than Death of Superman, what is your favorite or maybe like two or three favorite Superman stories? Oh, so question. comics, it could be animated, it could be movie. Like if you had to like drill down like the top three Superman stories you've ever encountered or experienced, what would they be? Oh man, that's such a good question. There was just a really fun run in like 99, 2000 when it was, I think it was Jeff Loeb and Ed McGinnis. Because Ed McGinnis kind of drew him a little cartoonish with like, yeah. It, but it but it worked and it was a way where it was it was just fun for a year it was fun you know like the b13 virus transformed metropolis and it was just it was you wanted to read the comics the flip side of that was um oh shoot what was the storyline called it was a year-long storyline jim lee did the art who is you know by far my favorite artist so i hate to criticize was that unchained anything. or unbound or something like that no way before that it was the one where like uh was it the vanishing or um shoot it was the one where like, you know, half the world disappeared and Superman got all dark and introspective and there was a priest that he would go do confession to. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. I mean, the art is incredible. For Tomorrow? Yes, For Tomorrow. Good memory. Yeah. But I, you know, the mopey Superman never works for me. Yeah, right. He's rooting and, and too introspective and like, you know, there was some story Don and I totally passed on where like he lost his powers for you and decided to walk across America. And it's <laughs> yeah, like, okay, <laughs> come on. <laughs> But other great ones. I actually really liked the War World saga that just wrapped up because mm -hmm. uh, it was fresh and interesting and totally different. And then like seeded the actual DC stage to his son for a year, mm -hmm. which was pretty cool. One of the nine kind of related to what we were talking about earlier. One of the knocks against Superman is that people who try to like make him edgy or try to make him dark and gritty. They, they say that like Superman stories are boring. You know, he's too powerful He's like, you know, he's got no weaknesses. Like you can only use kryptonite so much before it gets tired. And, you know, like I, I think that Superman is one of the most interesting characters because like his his weakness isn't kryptonite, right? His weakness is he loves humanity so much, right? Like his humanity is his strength and his weakness. And yeah. and stories that get that are the ones that I that I love. And, you know, my favorite Superman story of all time is a uh, Kurt Busiek story called a secret identity which yeah. is kind of like this meta like this kid this kid in the real world named clark kent and you know as a joke his parents always buy him superman like swag all the time and then one day he wakes up with superman's powers yeah yeah and and he meets a girl named lois and and it, it kind of morphs into a, a traditional superman story and i always thought like that's the movie i want i want like charlie kaufman and spike jones to do like a real meta secret identity adaptation because i think that you know that to me is like the ideal superman I, story i've always kind of dreamt of writing a superman screenplay i mean you know maybe now's my moment but yeah um, hey dc if you're listening <laughs> yeah, one thing i'd love to to partially base it off of actually is my favorite non-canonical miniseries is american alien mm -hmm. it's fantastic and it's different artists for each for each book but it's basically you know young clark finding his way in the world they don't do it in kind of the same way that's been done a whole bunch of times. Like he just, he moves Metropolis as a, as a kid basically. And he's trying to, you know, sort out jobs and love. And it's one of the rare times you see him have a girlfriend, you mm -hmm. know, who, who just happens to be kind of this down on her luck. I'm not that familiar with that storyline actually. It's so. so good. And like, you know, Bruce Wayne and Batman are kind of involved, but there's just this amazing scene. And I think book four between Clark, who's just a cub reporter at this point and Lex Luthor, who just treats him with complete and total disdain. But they have this amazing monologue between the two of them about Lex's kind of vision, which is that humanity can perfect itself and doesn't need help from an alien. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's fabulous. You know, and that's that goes back to like what you were saying earlier about, you know, Superman's greatest enemy is cynicism. And that's why I think Lex Luthor works 
you know, that's the other complaint is that like every Superman movie, the villain is like Sleuther and we want to see him punching somebody. But like the, you know, to again, back to the parallel to, to, to the president, he talks about a battle of wills. And that's ultimately what the Superman Luthor rivalry is. It's a, it's a, it's not about punching each other. It's a, it's this battle of wills and hope versus cynicism. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, Lex embodies. He may believe in the perfection of, of humanity, but he's really talking about himself. <laughs> you yeah, know, Lex, what I mean? is, Lex is best right because he's the perfect man in, in his view. Right. You know, he even in that. I think it's a different book where he actually makes Clark Kent feel his muscles. He's like, see, these are real. I had to work for these. Uh, they don't come from the sun. <laughs> What was I just going to say? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's when Lex's schemes are actually the best. It's not when he makes some kryptonite robot. It's right. when he turns people against Superman through through lies. And and then, only then does Superman sort of doubt himself. You know, not necessarily in a mopey way, but that's that's more damaging than kryptonite. I mean, I, I've long argued that, you know, I, I liked Man of Steel enough. I, I didn't like the the third act of that movie. But my main issue with Batman v Superman was I felt the problem with that movie is that Ben Affleck should have shaved his head and just played Lex Luthor because Bruce Wayne in that movie is ultimately Lex Luthor. He's this rich tech billionaire who, you know, creates a kryptonite weapon to kill Superman. Like that's the, his whole storyline. Like you should have just made him Luthor because that that's, that's the perfect Lex Luthor. And and then had Batman be his friend. My dream Lex is, do you watch Billions? Mm Mm-hmm. Have you seen Corey Stahl in Billions? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my. He dream said he was scene. so wasted as the villain in Ant Man that he would have been. He would have yeah. been a great. Lex my Lex. dream scene that nobody's made yet, but it's been in comics over and over and over, is where you know Lex is uh, on the top of his L shaped building, looking out these plate glass windows over his city, and Superman just kind of flies up with his arms folded and stares at him with his eyes glowing. You know, the one yeah. person who can challenge him. No one has put that in a movie yet, and it drives me nuts. <laughs> Cody, I could talk DC with you for. For hours and hours, but I know that we don't have that kind of time. In the meantime, how can folks find Grace and where can they find you online? CodyKeenan.com. It's the first time I've ever had my own website <laughs> where most of the big tour events just wrapped up as of yesterday, but but I keep adding things all the time, uh, whether they're digital or in person. I'm still traveling uh, every once in a while. I'm trying to take December off to hang out with my daughter, but uh, I'm Cody Keenan on Twitter, Instagram, online. You know, as a writer, I usually hate almost everything I write, but I'm intensely <laughs> proud of this book. And the reaction to it has made me very, very happy, especially when I'll get, you know, one of my email addresses is public, my academic one. So I'll, I'll wake up every morning to one or two mm. or more emails from, from strangers, which is wonderful to see. But the best ones were uh, just before the midterms, a couple of people actually said it inspired them to go out and canvas for their candidate and then that's something i hadn't imagined uh yeah and uh you know talk about something that'll make you hopeful right well there you go like I, we, we we said it earlier grace is the reason the democrats held on to the senate in <laughs> in 2022 so everyone thank cody keenan cody thank you so much for for coming back and and chatting with us about all things obama and superman oh, anytime dude do it again if i ever do write this screenplay you'll be the first place i come that's awesome i'll, I'll hold you to that all right. I appreciate Good it. Good to see you, Keith. Yes, sir. Take care.